No one said it would be easy. Making a series about incredible animal journeys. I don't think I've ever seen a humpback so skinny. It didn't even look like a humpback whale anymore. As part of the dive team, it's hard to kind of watch events unfold and know that there's nothing you can do. But as the film crew, really what we were there to do is show people what's actually happening out there. But nothing could prepare us for what we discovered along the way. They say that every journey starts with the first step. But actually, it starts with much more. Our planet is on the move. Millions of animals making millions of journeys. And every one of them with a story to tell. As we set out on a journey of our own. Taking off. Whoa, OK. That was really, really close. We learned how extraordinary. <gasps> oh, there it is. And how essential these wild travelers are for the health of our planet. Filmed over three years across all seven continents. Oh my God, that was amazing. <laughs> we united the world's best filmmakers. I love that feeling of seeing something that nobody else has ever seen. Oh, for the moment, my this is amazing. And scientists. Oh, that's it, that, yeah. The more you know about a species, the better you can conserve it. Discovering how technology can unlock their secrets. Now, let's be honest, the path wasn't always smooth. <laughs> but today, it's the animals that face the biggest obstacles. It's really heartbreaking. This animal, it may not survive. Oh my God, that was so close. It was so close. We track these lifelines across the globe on a voyage of discovery. And now we want to take you behind the journey. In the warm waters of Hawaii, we set out to follow one of the longest migrations of any mammal on Earth. Our research began bright and early that day. One of the questions I used to get asked quite frequently as a whale researcher is, why whales? My answer was always, well, why not whales? Have you seen them? Have you met a whale? This area here, the RR Channel, it's just one of the most amazing places to work. Every year, humpback whales travel 3,000 miles from Alaska to Hawaii to breed and give birth. Yeah, whale? Thanks, Tess, thank you. Is it? Working hand in hand with leading experts. Up, up, and away. Okay, baby's coming up. Oh, that's it, that's, yeah. Meant that our footage could directly support scientific research. We'd been out all day filming humpbacks, mostly focusing on moms and calves.
But we were about to find out that not every traveler will reach their destination. We heard on the radio that one of the whale watching boats here had come across an entangled whale. This whale was probably only four or five years old. When we see entangled whales here in Hawaii, many of them have come all the way from Alaska with that debris attached to them. It can be anything from crab pots to fishing nets to fishing lines. When I really saw the condition of the whale when I got in the water, I really wanted to do something to help. And I think I even remember asking the producer at the time if we could just try something. The protocol is to call us into the hotline, and this alerts our entanglement team. You know, what's always going through your mind is like, what are we going to have? Every disentanglement is different. You have to have people that are trained, experienced, authorized to respond. It's dangerous. Bring a 40-ton animal, 45 feet long, and it doesn't necessarily know you're there to help it. We took advantage of Rachel's team and the film crew. One aspect they had was drones. The imagery was critical to getting that whale free. There's a lot of loops in the water. We saw that that line was too embedded. It had gotten to the back of the mouth and had gone in a couple inches. So we weren't going to be able to pull that out that easily. So now we had to trim. Just nice and slow. Can you let, you have a little bit more slack. Yep. Okay, got that. And even his poor condition as this whale was, I think at times it was doing six to eight knots. First bundle. And that's pretty fast on the water when you're trying to cut the whale free. Yeah, it's still on the tail. So keep a little slack now. Oh, you got it. Perfect. Nicely done, guys. Thank you. Come on. We did not want to do more harm to that animal. It's just like frayed lines and everything. Can we try and grab those? Up? Yep. <laughs> Okay, he's going underneath the boat. Coming right up under the boat. Oh, something happened. Uh, I'm sure where that line is. Okay, Here we go. go. I think we're caught. I think we're caught on the motor. Sometimes they'll do this. The whale headed under the boat, and the line got temporarily caught in one of the engines. But it ended up breaking the line on the left flipper and it just came unraveled. Not as planned, but it worked. Give me line. Have, have line. Get rid of, get rid of that, that hook. Empty that line. And the whale did make another approach to us. It got right beside the boat. Then you really see the eyeball is tilting up a little bit, it's looking at you. It was like crap, you know, this whale is not in good shape now. If we only we had gotten to this whale three and a half weeks earlier. We know as a team, we're not gonna be successful all the time, but you do your best. But the probability is this animal, it may not survive. These are whales that you get to know. They come back every year. This is without a doubt the saddest thing I've ever seen. As that day ended, we thought it would be the end for that young female. But in fact, the next day as we came out to continue our research, we encountered her again. But this time she wasn't alone.
unlike us, wild travelers have no borders, no boundaries. To film these incredible animal journeys, we had to make incredible journeys of our own. So this is day one of looking for Arctic foxes. As you can see, I'm fully kitted out here. It's about minus 25 degrees. It can get down to about minus 40 with wind chill. Uh, we've got to watch out for having frostbite as well. We've got two fox dens that we found, but no foxes so far. It's kind of like a white needle on a very big white haystack at the moment. Arctic foxes are nomadic. In winter, they can travel over 1,000 miles to find food. With a range this big, how do you find the Arctic's very own Snow White? Fox dens are their best bet. The team uses a motion-triggered camera trap to check for activity. We found both an entrance and an exit hole, which is pretty good news as well. So yeah, fingers crossed. First light. The team heads out to see what they've caught on camera. The foxes have left a little gift. Well, we weren't really sure if there was anything here, but Somebody has definitely marked their territory. So this is our lovely camera trap, as you can see. There's lots of fox pee on it. This? <gasps> oh, there it is! <laughs> You'll see its nose. You'll see the black of its nose. Oh, it's yeah! Nice. <laughs> Badass! <laughs> that is good. This smelly calling card confirms that the crew is in the right place. But after a promising start, we're still being outfoxed. So it's been quite a few days for us now. Um, we've been looking everywhere for these foxes. Nearby is the settlement of Utkayagdik, the northernmost city in the US. Fortunately for us, we've got the local community and they said go and check out the local rubbish facility. So we're here today to see if there's any action. While the garbage dump might seem like the last place to look for wildlife, animal journeys are coming into contact with human activities like never before. I don't know if you can see below me, but we've got some fox footprints here, and they are fresh. There are footprints everywhere. Where we see trash, the fox sees treasure. <laughs> the garbage dump provides an easy food source in the depths of winter. Foxes have been really difficult to film here. So having a moment like this is amazing, but it doesn't happen very often.
Filming animals on the move requires a ton of planning, a dash of good luck, and a whole load of cutting edge tech. But hey, we can't get it right all the time. Ay, ay, ay. It looks like the gear's stripped. Oi! Meow! They're bloody awkward, these things, aren't they? Do you know nothing about camera work? You don't get this when you're working. Hi. The wind's definitely getting worse. Oh, look at that. Yeah, it was deeper than I was expecting. <laughs> Not easy to make, only a bit of, like progress. <laughs> what on earth have we got here? <laughs> this is our pink flying drone. Wow. And there's a little bit of science that says that flamingos recognise predators based on colour. Pretty in pink, a clever disguise so we don't spook the birds. I can't believe I've come all the way here to fly a pink chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, ready? Ready for some gas? We're very, very, very hot today. I mean, it's, it's baking hot, and we just can't get enough thrust out of it. Well, one thing's for sure. When an animal isn't on the move, it's a whole lot easier to film. Wandering albatross spend nearly 90% of their life at sea. When they do come to land, it has to be for a very special reason. Or, a very special someone. <laughs> but to film these long distance lovers in their element, The crew needs to buckle up and hold tight. Then you made it out. Wanderer by name and by nature. These big birds harness wind power from huge waves, soaring across eight million square miles of ocean. And I've lost him. Where's he gone? They're just Houdinis. I don't know how they do it. With only a rare glimpse. Hey, we've got one off the stern of the boat. They need to make the most of every opportunity. With some highly specialized gear. We've been using a gyro stabilized camera system, which is amazing. So even in these rough conditions, when the boat's been thrown around, we're still getting really smooth shots of the albatross. Nice. <laughs> you alright? How's it looking? Yeah. Yeah, I think this is quite, this is a nice one. That's lovely. But they don't just want to film the albatross. They want us to be able to fly like one. 
to mimic their flight, we need to use a racing drone. But uh, in this much swell, this boat's just not stable enough. So I think we're going to need a bigger boat. Good morning on board the Explorer and greetings from the Mudrope. They say that size doesn't matter. Take it off in three, two, one, here we go. But in this case, it kind of does. One of the ways we're reducing risk when flying drones like this is to make sure we have a wide, stable landing platform. And that's why we're on this big boat right now. <laughs> big ship! <laughs> the captain's gonna kill me. This 370 foot expedition ship is home for the next month. How are you doing? Yo! Because do you know how big they are? They're like the Boeing 737 of the planet Earth. If you want to know how to fly like an albatross. They have one very nice trick that they will lock their wings. Ask an ornithologist. So if you imitate me. So another foot-ish. It will be that big. Can you imagine a bird this size? <laughs> it's the biggest on the planet Earth. Wow. <laughs> Javier has traveled the world studying birds. Oh my goodness. But he's never flown like one. Let's go for it. Okay. Take it off. All right. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh my. This is like a Star Wars, but not. <laughs> oh my. I don't know how Rafa doesn't get seasick with this. Oi, oi. <laughs> Oh my, that's spooky. So how does that look to you? It looks good, but uh, the only one thing is that the wandering albatross are much, much bigger. Yeah. They go a bit slower when they do the turns. Yeah, you have to think <laughs> like an albatross. Oh, just think like an albatross. Just feel the wind, yes, feel the wind. Okay, all right, all right. But to do that, you need the right conditions. Just gonna see what the weather's doing. And it's another very beautiful but flat, calm day for the Southern Ocean. No big waves, not yet. What we're really after is big wave, giant swell, so we can feel the power of the ocean and fly within it. Pretty calm again. Compared to most people on the ship, we've got to be the only two wishing for bigger seas. <laughs> Sometimes, wishes do come true. We just woke up to some rough seas, which uh, is what we want. Like, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> it's going to be great. At last, Rafa can flex his wings. We're basically just practicing the moves, filling out the waves. Wow. And we can ride the wind like an albatross. These 
these aerial giants can travel 70,000 miles in a year. But these days, not everyone makes it back to land. Each year, albatross are lured by the hooks and lines of industrial fishing. The albatross will get a hold on the bait, they get hooked, and then they go down and they, they drown. It makes me horribly sad. It's now the single greatest threat to the species. Some lifelong soulmates never return. When we set out to film this series, we knew that we'd face some challenges along the way. But nothing compares to what the wildlife is up against. Animal journeys formed over thousands of years are in real danger. Physical barriers, disorientation, habitat loss, climate change, making it harder than ever to get from A to B. Some animals are already being affected before we've even had a chance to learn more about them. East Africa's Great Rift Valley is home to three quarters of the global population of lesser flamingos. These pink carpets can number over a million birds. Constantly on the move, they can be tough to track down. And the flamingos, they're quite mysterious creatures. They come right across the Rift Valley looking for the right lake. They just, they do what they want, really. Only by enlisting expert help did we have any hope of getting close. Scientist Timothy Munami has studied flamingos for the last 17 years. In the last ticket, Flamingo have gone away from the normal pink carpet legs. And nobody up to this moment understands where they are. Finding and filming these unpredictable birds is going to be harder than ever. This is um, inspired. While the crew sets out in search of the biggest flocks, the science team is a bit more hands-on. Wow, we've got a lot of flamingos. The safety of flamingo comes priority number one. We are heading now to process them at our ringing station. Timothy's new project is using rings or bands to find out where the flamingos are going. With these rings, I a tried and tested method used for more than a hundred years. One, seven, five. How oh, it does fit it? And these days, we can all get involved in bird science. Even people at home can help us to monitor and conserve flamingo by reporting these two plastic rings. The white one is Kenya, and this is. Lake Bogoria. Once these rings have been photographed by tourists, be it on Facebook, be it on Twitter, or any other media, 
we can easily tell where they were ringed. Across the lake, Wish us luck. <laughs> the crew gets word that larger numbers are starting to gather. Oh, there's a bigger group, way big group hang on the right. Yeah, oh. lots and lots coming in just now. This is, yeah, this is pretty cool. Yeah. And I'm right in amongst them all. Flamingos all over the place. But Timothy worries that a flock this size could soon become a thing of the past. Human activities are coming up at a very rapid rate. I can tell the changes are not sustainable. It is going to be very sad for our grandchildren not to find flamingo. This is the saddest moment. Projects like this are the key to better understanding and protection. How I wish I could have wings. I would have already joined them. about 75 miles offshore. And sometimes I worry a little bit that I'm gonna get seasick because it's a tragedy of a marine scientist that gets seasick. Oh yeah, you can see it, that's cool. It's a bit of an expedition, it's an adventure, and we never know what we're gonna find when we come out here. The mission today is to find and film a pocket-sized swimmer who spends up to 30 years in the open ocean. Green sea turtles. For the series, we filmed the terrifying start of hatchling life. to their miraculous return. To nest at the exact same beach. When they're all grown up. But when it comes to their teenage years, little is known about where the young turtles go or what they do. We have to find them out here. This is a huge, vast area, and so it can be very difficult. We may get skunked. Our search isn't a total drop in the ocean. We head for a juvenile turtle's favorite place to hang out. Golden rafts of sargassum. It's a floating algae. In a way, it acts as an oasis in the middle of the ocean where a lot of these little creatures uh, have a little bit of safety. When it pushes together like this, it reminds me of the yellow brick road in The Wizard of Oz. Ryan, do y'all see that? Ryan, do you see this? Good catch. Unfortunately, it was our first catch of the day and it was a party balloon. The turtles are normally incredibly camouflaged, so it's hard for us to spot them, and it's very easy for us to get distracted by floating coconuts or flip-flops that kind of look like a turtle or pieces of junk and plastic, marine debris that ends up out here. Coconut, yeah. We're really good at spotting coconuts. Oh, Ryan, what's up? Uh... Turtle. 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 Turtle.
Ah, very cool. Got eyes on it? Sort of. Yeah, but I remember the patch. I do too. Straight back. Right there at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock. Yep, still see it. Swimming just below the surface. Took a breath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, well, yeah it's swimming out still. I do not help the animal. Straight back. See it? Slow down. And it's out of range. There we go. Go, Billy. Oh, right here. Nope, it's moving like a little Porsche in the water. It's going fast. Nice. Good job, Ryan. Good job, AJ. That's exciting. It's a green turtle. To find out more about these wayward teens, Kate is using tiny satellite tags. These are really small. They're about the size of maybe a little piece of chocolate or some party cheese, little cubes of party cheese. The work that we do is very quick, and we try to minimize our handling time for these animals, so we minimize the stress. So anybody have a time? Yeah, 4.30. 4.30. If we're able to study and monitor these animals over the long term, we can better understand how our ecosystems may also be changing with time. These animals can be a bit of a canary in a coal mine. Fitted with her tracker backpack, she's ready to hit the waves and face whatever challenges lie ahead. Okay. We're so fixed in our own human world. We need technology to better understand what is the world to them. Good luck, little buddy. This tiny traveler is now joining the ranks of a very important scientific community. Without them, we could have never made this series. We can now follow animal journeys like never before, thanks to an explosion in tracking technology. Creatures large and small, fitted with specially designed tags Scientists are calling them biologgers. A world wildlife web. Recording and sending information from places that humans can never reach. You can see a green turtle is following this current. So in a few weeks, several thousands of kilometers. Welcome to the data center for the biggest satellite-based animal tracking system on the planet. All this technology in this room, all these sophisticated electronic tags, all these satellites 800 kilometers above our heads, all this for what? To serve the planet. And this network is about to get a turbo boost. Launching a new constellation of satellites dedicated to the study of incredible animal journeys. We need knowledge to know where the animals live, where they go, where they breed, where they feed. And we need all this knowledge to better protect, to establish marine protected areas, for instance, national parks, regional parks, migration corridors. We need to know to better protect.
We still have much to learn about our planet on the move. But one thing we do know, every journey is a matter of life and death. The first time we encountered the entangled whale, she was alone and she was dragging line. Well, it was clear that it was kind of its last days. It was really heartbreaking. Entanglements lead to mortality through starvation. You see whales go to the very end of their energy reserves before they actually succumb to these injuries. It's a very, very painful thing to watch. There were sharks starting to follow that animal, which is a bad sign. The tiger sharks are getting kind of brazen. And there are some really large ones as well. It's just about making sure that they know that you're not a snack. But just when we think this journey is coming to an end. So a lot of times we'll use underwater cameras that will help us get a visual assessment of the animal. When we were looking at that footage, we were also listening to it. We noticed calls. And it really struck us. We were wondering, are they calling other whales? Then, something extraordinary. To our surprise, the second whale came in. First thing we could see him do in the water was he moved all those tiger sharks off with a big swish of his fluke. It's weird how the humpbacks kind of accepted us as safe, but knew that the tiger sharks weren't safe. And I think that really points to some sort of higher level of intelligence. It was a real feeling that not only was he giving her physical support, but also there was some emotional support. It's something we hadn't seen before. It's something we've heard of from whaling days when one whale would help out another whale that was caught by whalers. Another whale would stand by and do anything it could, even at the risk of being caught itself. And to see that behavior play out was absolutely remarkable. One of the things the companion whale did is raise her up slightly, just so that she could breathe easier. And it's so sweet, all oh, that moment where it kind of holds her up. That was really touching. What was particularly striking here, he was prepared to stay with this entangled and distressed whale as that distressed whale faced the end. There was no chance that the favor would be returned in kind. And so it really does seem to be a moment of compassion. It really felt like a loved one coming in to hold someone's hand during their last moments.
In a rapidly changing world, animals are struggling to keep up. And ancient migration routes are at risk. The challenges that we face are immense, and they can seem insurmountable. But every journey begins with one small step. To protect these incredible animal journeys, we still have a long way to go. It counts what we do in our daily lives. We can make choices that make a difference. Animals have made these journeys for generations. Now, their future is in our hands.